My name, uh, as Anthony said, is Brian Glassman. I am the branch chief of the Poverty Statistics Branch in the Social, Economic, and Housing Statistics Division at the Census Bureau. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for attending the session today. I'm really excited uh, to be chairing this first session of the first annual, hopefully, uh, SIP conference. Um, just to make sure you're in the right place, the session title is Session 1, Employment, Labor Market, Participation, and Job Loss. Uh, we have three great papers uh, today that, that are going to explore this topic, um, and we're going to go in the order that is on um, on the program. Um, just so you have an idea of how we're set up, each presenter is going to have 20 minutes to present their paper. After that, we will have uh, discussions uh, for each paper, and, and they will have about eight minutes each to talk about the paper. And that's going to leave us with about 15 to 20 minutes at the end for audience Q&A. Um, in order for everyone to have enough time to present, I'm just going to ask that you save questions uh, to the end. Um, you can put questions in the chat, although um, we're probably we're not going to respond to those until we get to the Q and A uh, portion of the chat at the end. Okay, so again, thank you very much. Um, hope everyone enjoys uh, the program as as we begin. So our next presentation is job recalls and worker flows over the life cycle, and that will be presented by Justin Lamb. Um, Justin, when you're ready, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present here in the virtual SIP conference. Uh, my name is Justin Franco Lamb, and this project is Job Recalls and Worker Flows Over the Life Cycle. It is a joint project with Sin Chung Chu. We're both economics PhD candidate from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, next slide, please. So job recalls being defined as returning to the previous employer after a jobless spell are pervasive. Over 40% of unemployment spells end with recalls in the U.S. labor market. Next. Labor market dynamics can be very different when recalls are taken into account, because this means that not all layoffs are associated with the destruction of match capital. Next. This project studies the life cycle behavior of recalls. In particular, the life cycle analysis of recalls reviews dramatic heterogeneity among workers of different ages. We find that old workers has a higher recall share than young workers. Next. The contribution of this paper is threefold. On the empirical front, the paper documents novel facts on the life cycle behavior of recalls. First, as mentioned previously, we documented that the share of jobless spells that end with recalls is strongly increasing in age. This means that among the, among the jobless spells that have ended, the share of it that ends with recalls is higher for old workers than young workers. Second, we document that recalls differ significantly in wage outcomes than new job findings or job to job transitions. We find that recalled workers, their wage barely changes as opposed to the other two transitions. Next. This adds to our understanding to the labor market behavior over the life cycle. It is known that the job finding rate, the U to E rate, is decreasing but quantitatively similar over the life cycle. Taken at face value, the quantitatively similar job finding rate masks vast heterogeneity in job finding behavior over the life cycle because we document that the recall share for old workers is higher than the young workers. Next. This also adds to our understanding to the empirical relationship between recall and unemployment. The seminal paper by Fujita and Moscherini in 2017 documents that the aggregate recall share co-moves positively with the aggregate unemployment rate over the business cycle. And for this paper, we document that the recall share co-moves negatively with the unemployment rate over the life cycle, meaning that recall share is higher for old workers but at the same time, the unemployment rate for old workers is lower than young workers. Next. On a theory front, after documenting the empirical facts, we write down a model that can explain them. The model has two key elements. First, we introduce the possibility of getting back to the previous job after an unemployment spell. Second, we introduce a job ladder of match specific productivity and allow for on the job search. Next, this adds to the many theories of worker flows over the life cycle. For example, Burdett and Mortensen, Postolini and Robin. These are prominent models with on the job search. 
Um, however, to match the decreasing job finding rate and decreasing job separation rate is quite challenging in standard search model. Take, for example, the Burdett and Mortensen with on the job search. Once worker gets unemployed, there is no longer heterogeneity. And that's why the job finding rate is flat over the life cycle. Next. And the upshot of this paper is that once the empirical prevalence of recalls is accounted for, the model can reproduce all the worker flow rates over the life cycle as in the data. Next. The third contribution is that we then take the calibrated model to study the cross-section dynamics over the business cycle. It is documented that the matching efficiency decreases in recessions, and so we did a uh, experiment that considered transition dynamics of the economy in response to a drop in the matching efficiency. What we get is that the aggregate recall share increases, which is consistent with what Fujita and, Musca and Moscarini in 2017 has documented. But we also get that the unemployment rate of young workers increases more than old workers. And the mechanism being that the young rely more on the matching function to find a new job whereas the old worker rely less on the matching function but gets more recall. We view the ability of the model to replicate the joint dynamics of life cycle and business cycle as a non-trivial success. Next. So let me go to the facts uh, right now. And also next slide. The data that we use is SIP, and SIP is suitable for this project because it assigns a unique ID to each employer for each worker. And because of this reason, we can then track whether the worker has gone back to their previous employer after an unemployment spell. We define the recall share as the following. On the denominator, it's all the workers who have gone out of unemployment by finding a job. We write it out as EUE plus EUE prime, where we denote EUE as the recalled workers and EUE prime as workers who found a new employer after the unemployment spell. This is to highlight that for workers who found a job out of unemployment, either you go back to your previous employer or you find a new employer. And in the numerator, we have the number of recalled workers. The ratio gives us the recall share. Next. So the first graph that I wanna show you is the bin scatter plot, where on the y-axis we have the recall share and on the x-axis we have the age. We see that the recall share increases from around 35% at age 25 to almost 60% at age 55. That is almost doubling the figure. The increasing recall share age profile is also robust to extensive controls. Next slides. We throw in controls such as uh, including the gender, education, race, occupation, industry, union, employer provider health insurance, year dummy, unemployment duration, UI recipiency, and job tenor quadratic. And we see that there is still a robust increasing recall share age profile. Next. We then exploit high quality administrative data, uh, the quarterly workforce indicator, which is a set of aggregate statistics derived from the uh, matched employer employee data in the US, the LEHD. The difference between SIP and QWI is that QWI is in quarterly frequency, uh, as the name suggested. So in order to compare the two series, we collapse the monthly SIP data into quarterly frequency and compare them. Because of the time aggregation, uh, recalls that happen within the quarter will not be captured. And that's why we see in this graph, the level of recall share is lower than the previous graph. However, most importantly, the increasing recall share age profile is reassuringly similar for the two series. Next slide. So now I'll move on to talk about the wage changes associated with different uh, transitions. We consider the three types of events, the workers who get recalled, workers who find a new employer after unemployment, and workers who make a job to job switches. Each event is defined based on two uh, employment spells. Negative tau denotes the tau month before ending the first employment spells, and positive tau denotes tau month after starting the second employment spell of event S. 
next. And then we estimate the following event study specification, where on the left-hand side, we have the log real wage of worker, of worker I at month tau before or after an event S. And on the right-hand side, we have the indicator I that takes value one for worker I at month tau before or after an event S. And we have controls including education, race, gender, occupation, and industry before separation and year. We take the month right before ending the first employment spell to be the base period. So the betas reflect the change in wage relative to the month uh, at the end of the first employment spell, relative to the month at the end of the first employment spell. Next slide. So the first event study that I want to show is the uh, recalled workers uh, event study. We split the workers into two groups. Workers aged between 23 years old to 35 years old, we label them as young. And for workers above 35 years old and below or equal to 60 years old, we label them as old. Um, apologies for offending anyone. Uh, and then on the y-axis, we have the betas. Those are the estimated coefficients. And on the x-axis is the event time. So the negative one that is on the event time means that it's one month before you get into the unemployment spell. And the value one means that it's one month after you get out of the unemployment spell and get back to your previous employer. And the estimated coefficients can be seen to be very close to zero and statistically insignificant. This means that the wage for recalled workers barely change, regardless whether you're old or young workers. Next slide. If we contrast this with the event study of workers who find a new employer, we see that for young workers, the wage still barely changes, but for old workers, we now see a significant drop in the wage they receive when compared to the wage you, they receive uh, in the first employment spell. Next slide. If we further contrast this with the job-to-job -job transitions, we see that the wage growth for young workers is higher if they make a job-to-job -job switch than the wage growth experienced by old workers who make a job-to-job -job switch. So all these three graphs shows us that for recalled workers, the wage change behavior is very different from the other two transitions. So this wraps up the empirical section, and let me move to the theory and the model in the next slide. And the next slide as well, thanks. So the model mechanism in a nutshell is that there are existing matches and they face idiosyncratic shock. If the shock is sufficiently negative, then the match will separate, but have a recall option. Separated workers wait for the idiosyncratic shock of the previous match to improve. And if it does improve sufficiently, they can reactivate the match and get recalled. In the meanwhile, they randomly meet new offers and decide to accept or not. The better your previous match is, the more likely the worker will go back to the previous job. And as workers climb up the match quality job ladder as they age, we get, we get that old workers are now associated with better matches and better matches associated with higher likelihood to be recalled. And that's why the recall share is increasing with age. In the next slide. So because of the time constraint, I cannot go into the details of the model environment and go through the equations, but I would like to tell you about the summary of the possible events. So in the next slide. There are three employment status here, and I would like to first start with the employed workers and talk about what are the possible events that could happen to them. There are five events that could happen. The model is cast in continuous time, so at Poisson rate lambda E, they will get hit by a cost shock. If the cost is sufficiently large, that is saying if the idiosyncratic shock is sufficiently negative, then the employed workers will separate from the match into unemployment, but with recall option. That's the first event. At Poisson rate delta, they will get hit by an exogenous destruction shock and the match will get destroyed and the worker goes into unemployment without recall option. At rate zeta, 
the employed workers will get hit by a godfather shock. That is, they, have, they will receive an offer that they cannot refuse. So they would have to make the job to job switch, even though the job that they receive may not be that ideal. And the fourth event is that they would have a job offer arrival rate at phi times p of theta. Phi is the on-the-job search intensity, and the p of theta is an equilibrium object where the theta is the labor market equilibrium tightness. When they receive this job offer, they would then have to draw a match quality from a distribution. And depending on whether this match quality is good or not, they will have to decide whether they make the job-to-job -job switch. And finally, they have a labor force exit at rate gamma. Now for the unemployed workers with recall option, there are two differences. The first difference is that they would get hit by the cost shock at rate lambda u. And this time when the cost shock is sufficiently small, so if the cost shock is sufficiently small, they will reactivate the match and get recalled. And the second difference is that for the job offer arrival rate, there's no longer the phi in front of the P of theta because there's no on the job search intensity. And finally, for the unemployed workers without recall option, there's no cost shock, there's no destruction shock, and no godfather shock. So that's the summary of the possible events in the model. So I'll move to the quantitative performance of the model now. So I'll have to skip uh, a few more slides. Next one, next one, next one, and the next one. Yep, this one. Thank you. So before I talk about the quantitative performance, Qualitatively, the model has the ability to replicate all the worker flows over the life cycle. The recall share has already been explained in the mechanism in a nutshell. So for the job finding rate, if we look at the old workers who are unemployed and with the recall option, because they're sitting at a better match, they get pickier. They're less likely to receive, they're less likely to accept outside offers. And that's why the job finding rate for old workers is lower than the young workers. That's how we can get a decreasing job finding rate. For the separation rate for old workers, because they are at better matches, uh, better match means you have higher match surplus. That's why you have a larger buffer zone for the cost shock. And that's why they separate less. That's how we get a decreasing separation rate. And for the job to job rate, for old workers, again, because they're at a higher match, it's harder for them to find an even better match. So that's why the job-to-job -job rate also declines over the life cycle. So these are the qualitative predictions of the model, but whether we can match the quantitative uh, data is another issue. So with, um, with only 13 parameters and a very simple model that we have in hand, that is, we add recall option to an otherwise standard search model with on-the-job search. We think that we view that the model's ability to match all four age profiles uh, pretty decently as a non-trivial success. The next slide. And as external validation, we look at the wage changes associated with different trans transitions. These wage changes are untargeted. So we look at the wage change for recalled workers, for workers who find a new employers after unemployment, for workers who make a job to job switches. And we find that these wage changes that are untargeted matches qualitatively to what we have estimated in the event study in the empirical section. So this validated our model. In the next slide. Okay. Uh, now I'll go to the transitional dynamics of the experiment. So what we did is we traced the transitional dynamics of the economy in response to a decrease in the aggregate matching efficiency. We consider an MIT shock of a size of the shock that is a 45% decrease in the matching efficiency. It is an AR1 process with the persistence of the shock to be 0 0.98. And agents solve the perfect foresight equilibrium. Next slide. And the key object here that we plot is the impulse response of the job finding rate. So on the left hand side, we plot the job finding rate uh, in the model with recalls. We focus on two groups, um, the labor market, the new labor market entrance and the 
and the workers with 20 years of working experience. We obtained this impulse response by plotting the percentage change of the job finding rate as compared to the steady state equilibrium. The key takeaways and the insight from this graph is that for the new labor market entrance, the job finding rate declines more than the experienced workers when getting hit by the matching efficiency shock. The reason is the following. For these young new labor market entrants, a defining feature is that they don't have a previous job. And so by definition, they don't have a recall option. And that's why they have to rely more on the matching efficiency to find a job to get out of unemployment. That is why when a matching efficiency shock hits, the job finding rate for the new entrants decrease more than the experienced workers. The experienced workers, they're sitting at a better match. When they're unemployed, they still have the recall option, so, have to, so they can rely less on the matching efficiency. That's why we can get that with the same matching efficiency shock, there's a differential impact of the new entrants and the experienced workers. And on the right-hand side, this is to contrast that in the model without recall, when we shut down the recall channel, we now see that for the new entrants and experienced workers, uh, the impact, the impulse response of job finding rate becomes the same. In the next slide. So if we look at the data for the job finding rates of uh, labor market entrants and non entrants in the blue line, we can see that for the new entrants, the job finding rates are more volatile than the non new entrants. And as an example, if we look at the 2008 recession, the job finding rate of the new entrants declines more than the non new entrants. So we see the blue line plummeted more than the red line. This is consistent to what we have found in the previous slide, uh, where the model predicts that for the matching efficiency drop to decline, the job, the, the job finding rate for young workers who have declined more than the experienced workers. In the next slide. So let me conclude. This paper's contribution is threefold. We first documents novel facts on the life cycle behavior of recalls. We then proposes a job ladder model with recall options. The upshot is that once we account for the recalls, which are empirically prevalent, in an otherwise standard job ladder model, it matches all worker flows over the life cycle, as in the data. And the key takeaways from the experiment that we did, the insight is that a drop in matching efficiency lowers job finding rate of young more than the old, because young relies more on the matching efficiency to find new employers. So that's all for my paper, and thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. Um, I'm sure we will be, uh, or you'll be getting comments on uh, on that in, in a little bit, but just want to say good job of uh, fitting a lot of information into a, a 20 minute presentation. Very, uh, a lot for us to think about. Um, Thank you. Moving on to uh, Janik's uh, talk once I get this uh, ready. All right, Hello, everyone. Go ahead. Hi, Brian. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chanik Cho. I'm from Chinese University of Hong Kong. I'm from the finance department. So I'm looking at what triggers a stock market participation. So in this project, I look at um, this um, employment protection laws in the US and how it affects household stock market participation. Next, please. So I think it's safe to say that the labor market is characterized by a lot of frictions, such as minimum wages, hiring and firing frictions, and so on. Um, and sometimes regulation have unintended consequences. As we know, for minimum wage, there is huge debate on um, what's the optimal minimum wage, or is it okay to have a minimum wage or not, right? So. Understanding the economic consequences of labor market friction is of first order importance. So in this paper, I'm trying to study uh, the impact of employment protection laws and its economic consequence, in particular for a household side. Next. 
So in the U.S., there is uh, something called at will rule where employers uh, can discharge their workers for any reason, uh, whatever it is, without taking any legal liability. Uh, however, some next please. Some U.S. states uh, have adopted a, this law called the wrongful discharge law to protect employees from unfair dismissals. Next. So this law has been extensively studied, especially in the uh, corporate side, and it is well known that overall it has negative impacts on corporate. For example, a recent RFS study uh, found that uh, firms experience lower investment rates and lower sales growth rate uh, after the adoption of employment protection laws, and the firms are less likely to hire so there is a less employment flows. And these negative impacts on stock market, I mean, the, on the corporates, um, is reflected into stock market. As you can see uh, from Surfling 2016 paper, stock market react to those news negatively. Next. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at the household side, uh, yeah, there are not many studies and uh, it's not clear how it benefits household other than obvious um, benefit of uh, higher employment protection. Next. So in this paper, I uh, study a new potential channel through which household may benefit and also you, uh, the entire economy may benefit from this WDLs. Next. So I ask in this paper whether these WDLs, uh, which are wrongful discharge laws, can induce household um, to be more willing to invest in stock market. Next. So why is it important question to think about? Why does it matter? Uh, first of all, stock market participation is uh, very important because Financial income can be a very important source of income for household. So if you don't invest in stock market, you miss out a huge opportunity of your lifetime income. At the same time, at the societal level, um, this is very important for uh, wealth inequality. The reason why uh, wealth inequality becomes worse is that uh, people don't invest in stock market. And stock market average returns are... 8% from 1946. So this is something that uh, especially low income household miss out because they don't invest in stock market. And stock market participation has important implication for firm side because it can reduce a firm's cost of capital. As more people invest in stock market, um, firms can reduce their cost of capital, right? So for those reasons, it is very important to think about what can lead household to invest in stock market more. Therefore, it is important to think about whether these laws can induce a household to invest more in the stock market. Next. Then you may ask why through which economic channel these employment protection laws may induce household to invest in stock market. So if you think about the optimal portfolio choice uh, for household and theoretically uh, where household are exposed to labor income risk. So if they are exposed to labor income risk, they are supposed to reduce their stock market exposure because they have something that they have to worry about other than stock market. And especially if their um, labor income growth is a positively related with the stock market, then it is possible that when uh, your portfolio um, crashes, especially during recessions, uh, your labor income can be affected negatively. So optimally, you have to reduce uh, your stock market to protect your consumption flow, right? But if you have this labor employment protection, that will reduce your left tail layoff risk, 
that will reduce your overall income uncertainty and your reduction in labor income uncertainty can make you more willing to take financial risk because now you have some kind of a room for taking extra risk. Um, yeah. So here I'm going to adopt this uh, difference in differences in research design where treatment groups are household who live in the states that adopted the WDLs. Otherwise, household belong to the treatment groups. Sorry, control groups. Next. So just to give you uh, the quick summary of what I found. Uh, first of all, I check whether really a layoff decreases uh, for states that adopted these WDLs, and I found that indeed uh, the layoff in the SIP data significantly decreases after the adoption of WDLs, and I check whether this uh, adoption of WDLs is also associated with higher stock market participation uh, consistent with my hypothesis, and I found that indeed household in the affected states increases their stock market exposure conditional on st stockholders as well as um, their propensity uh, to invest in stock market. And I also look at the heterogeneous uh, effect of this um, adoption on household and I find that um, young household and low income, low wealth and less educated household um, more sensitively re react to this adoption. And these are the household that are more protected by this law because they are more exposed to layoff risk than the rest of the sample. So this gives you uh, some kind of um, confidence that this mechanism behind uh, their increased exposure is indeed related to reduction in layoff risk. And in 1982, there was a reversal in Oklahoma, so I was wondering if there uh, is a reversal, whether they really reduce their stock market exposure because now their labor income risk goes up. And indeed, I found that opposite investment behavior when the law is reversed. Next. So why does it matter? So again, this is a new channel through which uh, the entire economy and a household can benefit from the WDLs. This is an undocumented channel. And this is also speaks to this uh, portfolio, the literature on portfolio choices and income risk. And uh, this literature struggles to find a causal uh, relationship uh, because if you just cross-sectionally look at your income risk, and portfolio, sometimes you end up seeing a positive relationship, even though theory tells you a negative relationship. So the reason is, let's say you are very risk tolerant. Once you're risk tolerant, you may choose a very risky job at the same time because you are risk tolerant, you can invest in stock market more. So then you end up seeing a positive relationship between income risk and your portfolio. Um, so, however, if you have a panel setting, you keep track of the same household in SIP data, and you use some kind of exogenous shock, you have a better uh, identification. And my finding shows, um, indeed, there is support for this uh, theory on income risk and portfolio choices. Okay, next. So these are the uh, large literatures that uh, my paper is related to. And uh, for the sake of time, I will move on to the next slide. So uh, loan for discharge laws can be classified by three forms, implied contract exception, public policy exception, and the good faith exception. And the literature, the legal literature and economic and finance literature finds that the good faith exception is the largest deviation from the at will rule, uh, therefore, Literature has found the biggest economic implications um, of the good faith exception among others. Therefore, I focus on the good faith exception as well and use other exceptions as a control variable. And my paper actually finds that uh, the good faith exception ha has only the significant relationship with the layoff as well as portfolio choices. 
but I do not find any impact of the implied contract exception and the public policy exception, which is consistent with what the literature has found. Next. So this map shows you um, which state adopted uh, which exception and which year. Um, I forgot to put the <laughs> uh, caption. So the very left is the good faith exception. And the second one is implied contract. And the last one is a public policy. So as you can see, the most states had uh, adopted uh, either implied contract exception or public policy, but only a few states adopted this, um, the good faith exception because this is the largest deviation from the Ed Will doctrine in the US. So I'm going to exploit geographic variation as well as time variation and use it as in um, difference and differences setting to study whether households that live in those states in that given year change their portfolio behaviors after the adoption. Next. So you may wonder whether this adoption is ex uh, really exogenous. If it is not exogenous, then uh, there could be endogenous relationship between household portfolio choices and the adoption of the good faith exception. And the literature has found that, yeah, this is something uh, that is decided at the state court. Um, therefore, there is a less chance that um, the lobbying activities are uh, going on. And also, if you think about stock market, it's very efficient because it reflects all relevant information. The, given that the stock market react to the adoption of this the good face exception means that stock market didn't know about that. It's a pretty exogenous event. Okay, next. So in terms of the data, I use this uh, nice survey of, of income and program participation data uh, from uh, 1984 panel to 1996 panels. The reason why my sample ends in 1996 panel is that the the very last, um, yeah, the very very last exception ends, uh, yeah, before 2000. So that's why, yeah, I use up until 1996. Okay, and. Yeah, because uh, this conference is a SIPP conference, I assume that everybody is well aware of uh, this uh, nice data set. Uh, so I think I don't have to explain more. Um, so what I like about this data the most is that, yeah, it provides a state. And unlike uh, PSID data, you can observe annual change, not biannual or triannual change, but you can observe annual change of portfolio for each household. So then you have a pretty high frequency uh, data for household. So after shock, you can have a clear, much uh, clear identification uh, by looking at their household uh, portfolio before and after shock. If it is a biannual, it's a little bit tricky because many things can happen um, between two years. Next. So I construct two measures to uh, measure each household exposure to stock market. Next. So the first measure is about intensity. So you are already stockholder. So uh, this is to capture uh, intensive margin. So given that you are stockholder, I look at how they change their overall stock market exposure by looking at their share of risk asset. Risk asset means mutual funds and stocks uh, in their total level of a financial wealth. Total level of a financial wealth means stocks, mutual funds, savings, and checking account, yeah, and the bonds investment. The second measure, next, second measure is to capture propensity to participate. So this is capture extensive margin. So I look at whether non-stockholders uh, become stockholders after the adoption of WDLs, okay? Next, however, my measure, I mean, my result is robust to different kinds of measures to uh, look at their stock investment. Next. So this is uh, the baseline specification. So left-hand side, outcome variables are either, um, yeah, intensity, intensive margin variable or extensive margin variable. And in the right-hand side, we have the dummy, DID dummy variables 
for either good faith, implied contract, and public policy, as well as uh, household level time varying characteristics, uh, uh, also household individual fixed effect, state fixed effect, time fixed effect. Next. So the first thing that I look at is whether layoff indeed decreases after the adoption of the WDLs. As you can see, after the adoption of the good base exception, the layoff in the SIP data significantly uh, decreases, but we do not see the impact from the implied contract and public policy. Next. So I look at the, the cross-sectional income variation uh, using a various measure. So at the state level, this uh, cross-section of volatility of income goes up, uh, sorry, goes down after the adoption, and also the difference between the 80 percentile and 20 percentile, the income level also goes down. Uh, yeah, so you can see the overall um, income volatility goes down given state. Next. So from the previous two slides, we see that the uh, overall labor income risk goes down after the adoption of a good phase exception. And consistent with the theory, this reduction in labor income risk is associated with increased stock market participation, as you can see from uh, intensive margin as well as extensive margin. Next. And this is a dynamic graph for extensive uh, margin. Next. And this is for extensive margin. Uh, household uh, become more likely, to, uh, are more likely to be stockholders from non stockholders. And this re result is stronger um, like uh, three years or four or five years after the adoption. Next. Um, so, so what I see uh, or show you is the average effect. However, we can imagine that this law affects um, those who are exposed to labor, uh, I mean the layoff risk, uh, yeah, more than other household. Next. Therefore, I look at the heterogeneous uh, impact of this law on household using low income, either low health and wage, age and uh, low education. Next. So as you can see uh, from these interaction terms, you can see those households who are more vulnerable to lay off risk increase their risk exposure more than other households. Next. Uh, and when there is a reversal, you can see the opposite risk taking behavior, meaning that people uh, reduce their risk exposure and be uh, more likely to be non stockholders from stockholders. Next. Next, please. So I do a lot of uh, further analysis. Uh, for example, I look at type of stocks, uh, which stocks they invest. They are more likely to invest out of state stocks, uh, which actually makes sense given that in state of stocks are experiencing negative shocks after the adoption of these uh, WDLs because it becomes uh, becomes more difficult to lay off investors, I mean, employees, so which is a negative news for companies. And also I see that this result is less likely to driven by first moment in fact, because I do not see any change in labor income level itself. Okay. And I do not see the impact of unemployment insurance on stock market participation change. And I want to emphasize that I also do the same task using IRS data at the county level, and I see the same pattern. Next. So just to conclude in this paper, I document the novel uh, economic channel through which a household and the entire economy can benefit from wrongful discharge laws. So what I found is household are more likely to increase their financial risk exposure after the adoption of employment protection laws. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chanak. Um, great job. Um, thank you to all our presenters. Um, we are now going to move on to the discussion part, part of our uh, program. Next, we will have John Creamer, um, and he will be discussing the last two papers.
Good morning, everyone. Um, just want to thank everyone for the opportunity or thank everyone for attending today and for me having the opportunity to read these two papers and participate in this inaugural SIP conference. Um, I think it's a, a great opportunity for us all to share research and the data that we do, we produce at the Census Bureau and just a good way for us to connect with researchers and, and learn about how people use our data. So I appreciate everyone's participation um, and signing up for the conference, both as for the attendees and then also the um, presenters. So today I'm going to be talking about the second two papers that we saw today, Justin's paper and Chanik's paper. Um, and I'm the in the Social Economic and Housing Statistics Division in the Poverty Statistics Branch with Brian, just to briefly introduce myself. Um, next slide, Brian. And so as like a general overall thought, I feel like all of the, the two papers that um, I'm commenting on here today, both cover key aspects of job loss and employment benefits beyond income. And I think a lot of times when we think of labor market stuff, we're thinking about unemployment rates and earnings and things of that nature. And there's all there's more, more complication to labor markets than just those kind of main outcomes. The first paper models how job recalls affect the labor market over the life cycle, both through the empirical data and then also the modeling procedure they do in the, the second half of the presentation. And then the second paper looks at how economic security through regulation affects financial risk taking in the stock market. And I think Chanik kind of talked a little bit in the start of the presentation about um, labor market frictions, but I kind of view it from an economic security perspective where people feel more secure in their jobs and they're going to do, um, that kind of frees them up to consume savings or investments in different ways. And I think all three papers, uh, not just the two that I'm commenting on, um, kind of show the uniqueness of the SIP panel since its introduction in the 19, in 1984. So I think it's a, a good example of, of the benefits of SIP. Next slide, Brian. So first with the, the first paper, and we can go to the next slide again. Um, the motivation is basically that the paper is looking to describe how job recalls affect the labor market overall. Um, and then just to get that definition out of the way, the job recalls are when an unemployed worker returns to the firm that they last worked at. So kind of that spell um, when they go from employed, unemployed, to put back to employed. The empirical portion of the paper looks at the prevalence of job recalls and how these recalls impact wages. Um, and then the model kind of improves on a search model um, to see how we can kind of, if we're thinking about how recessions or other job shocks um, happen in the future, how we can kind of think about the impact on labor markets. And then obviously SIP data is used to provide the empirical underpinnings and then Justin also uses the administrative data from the QWI. Next slide. And so a summary of the findings is that the we see that the job recalls are more prevalent for older workers compared to younger workers, but there's not much when we're looking specifically at the recalls, there's not much in the way of wage changes when people go into this recall or when they're kind of recalled to their jobs. Um, and probably should note in the figures that we'll see here in a second that the those results change when you're kind of looking at the, the different types of um, kind of switches from employed to unemployed um, and if it's a recall or not on the recall because there was the results we saw at the end where the younger workers, when they're going job to job, um, have higher um, earnings as a result of that. And that kind of matches, I think, with the prevailing wisdom of um, job switching. And then with the labor market search model, we see that when you start considering recalls, you can kind of switch the, cha the shape of the distribution to kind of match when you're doing these impulse responses to economic shocks. So next slide, Brian. And we can see here, Kind of small, but this is one of the, the main empirical findings where we can see the that gives us this stylized fact that recall rates um, are increasing over the age share. Um, and we can see that this result is robust, robust both without controls and with controls. Next slide. And then focusing on the impulse response um, rate as a result of the um, shock when we're doing the search model. We can see that when you add the recall to the data, 
you get the shape that works for basically the entire like with, with the recalls on the left side you kind of get the what we're looking what we're seeing in the data where the experienced workers have a better a higher finding rate for jobs compared to the, the new entrants and then when you're not considering this um, in the standard model on the right side both you're not being you're not capturing that difference in the way the labor market works next slide and so for just some suggestions that i had from reading the paper um, I thought with the empirical data, it would be interesting to see if we could capture what are the potential causes for recalls, just to kind of understand what's driving these things. Because you could also, like, on the one hand, I understand, I could see older workers have more experience with a potential employer. So if they get laid off and, like, the employer may want to bring them back in for a certain thing. Um, but it could also be because an employee is sick and they're taking a sabbatical of some sort, which would pop up in the data as, as unemployment. But realistically, there's some still like underlying connection between the workers. So I'd be curious just to know if we could capture kind of what's driving these recalls and why a potential reason why it's happening for these older workers. And then I'd be curious using just the, the full SIP data, if we can kind of get a sense of is the pattern changing over time um, and just seeing it through the different panels. And then I think I would use this information for the model to kind of see if you can add some more heterogeneity into the model to see if with these kind of particular things that you're finding in the empirical data, um, if you can kind of structure it to, to capture that any unique findings that you have. Um, and then finally, this is just kind of a, an outstanding question, I think, is that the pandemic economy, the recession that we saw in March and April of 2020, I think is very unique when you compare it to other uh, recessions in the past. And I'd just be curious to know, how do you think um, the empirical data and also your model would perform in a situation like we had in March and April? Um, but overall, great paper, and I enjoyed uh, getting the chance to read it. All right, Brian, next slide. And so for the second paper, and next slide. Next slide, okay, perfect. Um, so for the next paper, um, the study examines the relationship between the wrongful discharge laws and stock market participation. Um, and it uses SIP data from 1984 to, I thought in the paper, I think it was 2003, but in the pre presentation it was 1999. And it could have been that I just um, misinterpreted the, the paper. But in the, it focuses on the good faith wrongful discharge laws and so the treated states, at least from what I was reading the paper, are, and I'm happy to be corrected, um, were Arizona, Delaware, Louisiana, Nevada, Oklahoma, and Utah. Um, and kind of as I was saying before, I think the paper is really studying, it's kind of capturing the underlying relationship between economic security with people feeling more comfortable in their jobs when they have the layoff risk decreasing, and then quote unquote risky behavior on the other end with how they're using that security to try to um, get return more return through their savings. Next slide. And so the paper uses a difference in difference methodology um, to show that these protections lead to greater participation in the stock market and a greater share of assets that are, are stock holdings. Um, and then they, Chanik uses the, the brokerage data to show how holdings change as a result of the increase in participation with more out of stocks, out of state stocks being held. Um, and it's explained in the paper that this is kind of a proxy of holding a stock that is different to the, wherever their employer is. And then the robustness checks show that the results hold across different asset classes. Um, and then with the unemployment insurance and a couple of other things that were uh, discussed at the, the back half of the presentation. Next slide. And so first we can just quickly look at the event study or the difference in difference results. Um, and you can see that with the year relative to the adoption of the good faith exception, you can see that this effect on stock share is positive especially mainly in, in years three, four, and five, and probably in year two, it's also statistically significant from zero. Um, so there's a positive impact on stock share as a result of these um, good faith exceptions. Next slide. Next 
Next slide. There you go. Okay. And then we can see for the uh, effect on participation, uh, we get more participation, um, a, a stronger effect in terms of between years two and uh, greater than five after the implementation of these good faith exceptions. Next slide. And so I think some of the suggestions that I would have for this paper, um, one of which is that a lot of the good faith exceptions that are put into place kind of happened in the mid to late 1980s. Um, and then there was a lot of things happening during this time um, with income tax law, with the decrease in the, the top income bracket, as well as how stock options were treated as income. And I'm wondering if there's just some stuff that's going on in the background that we're not necessarily capturing perfectly, even with our differences in difference or difference in difference methodology. Um, so I'm just kind of curious if Chanak has any thoughts on how the how public policy kind of changing the background would have affected stock holdings on top of any sort of wrongful um, discharge laws. And much like Justin's paper, I'd like to see how these results kind of get broken by down by industry and occupation, just to kind of get a sense of who's driving these results, like who's getting more, um, who's increasing their stock holdings as a result of um, of these kind of like we can see that it's the low income or lower income workers, lower wealth workers, and younger workers. But is it kind of a sense of like are they working in certain industries, um, that sort of thing? And then finally, this is showing my age, like, how are people buying stocks prior to 2000? Like, I can remember when I was growing up, especially as we come up on Super Bowl Sunday, like, there was all of the E-Trade ads with the little baby, like, oh, you can buy your stocks online now. And, like, prior to this, I, like, assume you would just, like, call somebody and they would do the trade for you. And so I'm wondering how that just like the lack of the lower amount of technology in the late 80s and the early 90s, how does that affect the people who are then impacted by these wrongful uh, discharge laws? Um, so that's definitely a little more like not a lack of knowledge on my point, but I'd just be kind of curious to know if those, if just that relationship has any impacts. So overall, like just to conclude, I really appreciated the chance to read these two papers and enjoyed reading them. Um, and I hope that we can all have a, a good discussion here to to wrap up the the first session today. Thanks. Great, thank you, John. Um, I just want to thank all of our uh, presenters and discussants for and say I appreciate you staying on time. Um, we have pretty much exactly twenty minutes. Uh, at the end of the session where we can uh, start our Q&A session. Um, I think during the presentation, there might have been some questions in the chat that I saw pop up. So we may, um, we can kind of go back and look at those. Um, and also if there are any um, participants that want to ask a question, um, I think as Anthony said in the beginning that you need to raise your hand, uh, the hand button at the bottom, and that will allow uh, the, uh, the WebEx folks, or I guess Anthony, um, someone to unmute you uh, because you can't do it yourself um, unless you're on the panel. Okay. Um, I have another question from Tao Wang. Um, it's for Justin. It says, what particular moments did you target to estimate these parameters? Yep. Uh, so we have 13 parameters uh, and we target the empirical rate, uh, empirical recall share age profile job finding rate age profile, job separation rate age profile, and the job to job to job rate age profile. So the four flow rates age profile. Sorry, and I see as I scroll down, I saw that you did answer that in the chat as well, but thank you oh, yeah. for, for clearing that up for everyone. Yeah. Um, all right, from uh, Siki Lu for, for Chanik, is there a way to control for the role of unions? I'd imagine that unions are the household's first line of defense against layoffs. Yeah, oh, so as I sense. answered, yeah, in the chat, uh, SIP provides this union information from 1985 panel. Uh, so for that reason, I don't want to lose a 1984 panel, so I don't control for the union. Uh, however, I check whether it makes any difference. Uh, it makes a virtually no difference. The reason is that 
uh, this annual variable is a dummy variable that takes one if a household belongs to union, otherwise it's zero. It doesn't change much uh, for each household, meaning that like I rarely observe a case where a household becomes a union member uh, from non-union member or the other way around. Therefore, once I control for household fixed effects, it just mostly subsumes uh, like uh, the impact of unions, so it's uh, not significant. Yeah. Thank you, Chanak. Um, okay, before I jump in and ask a few questions, are there any other questions from either the other panelists, uh, the discussants, the audience? Um, this is also an opportunity if the discussants want to address, or not the discussants, if the uh, presenters want to address any comments made by the discussants, kind of um, open it up to, uh, to whoever has any comments. Otherwise, I can, I can jump in. I'll give it a minute. I think the so in your paper and also in our paper, when we look at the old workers who find a new employer, you know, they suffer a larger wage loss. And I think that's you didn't specifically look at whether you look at, at uh, going to a new employer or not. But you, um, the big picture is the same that for old workers, they suffer uh, a larger wage loss. And I think from um, from the model perspective, we view it as in that very simple model that we have that older workers are higher up on the match quality so if you're higher up then it's a larger drop uh, but of course in the reality there is much more things going on and uh, i think your paper addresses those concerns that um, there could be other issues like whether the scarring effect will be larger for these old workers and just to clarify, Justin, um, when for unemployment, your unemployment analysis, are you limiting the type of unemployment or can it be voluntary and involuntary um, unemployment? Um, so we, we did not, um, we did not limit it. So for mm -hmm. the version that we have now, it's uh, any kind of unemployment. So we did not differentiate between it's voluntary or involuntary uh, separation. I also have kind of like a general question, right? We're in in a SIP conference, um, and I'm just I think some of you kind of addressed like why you chose SIP and why that was like good for your paper. But if you could just kind of comment a little bit about like what brought you to using SIP, how has that helped with your uh, well, in some cases your 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 graduate studies or um, I don't know, just kind of anything in that realm. Maybe um, I can. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, maybe I, I can go first. Um, yeah, like I said in my presentation, um, C paper is really nice for finance researchers because you can observe annual change of a portfolio for each household. While if you look at the survey of the consumer finances, um, it's a the triannual and they don't keep track of the same household. So you cannot really do uh, this uh, natural quasi natural experiment because you don't see for each household how they change the portfolio. And another data set that is widely used for finance researchers is a PSID data, Panel Study Income Dynamics. Uh, but then that data set provides biannual portfolio change from 1999. And even before that, you don't, you don't even have a biannual change. So in that sense, this uh, SIPP data is very attractive to finance researchers who are interested in portfolio changes or other uh, decision yeah, variables. Yeah. I just wanted to throw out there that all three of these papers did a really nice job of leveraging the breadth of data that's in the SIP using methods that, you know, are focused on the dynamics and look at change um and i i was i was really happy these um all three did a really nice job um and i think that the these are the strengths of the sip is to be able to tie in you know all of these changes across uh across domains and when you can 
you know, even extend with the, the history data that's collected as well, you know, you really have a, a really interesting picture of, you know, how, what connections there are to make and how people's lives and the trajectories that they, they are on um, are impacted by different shocks or different situations. And, you know, so I, I really thought that the three papers did a nice job of, uh, of leveraging SIP. Um, I think it's an appropriate data to use for the questions they were asking. Um, so uh, applause to the, to the three papers. And I think just to follow up on Chanik's comment is that, uh, so we started off the project by looking at what are the panel data that we could exploit. And in the US, I think SIP, uh, NLSY, and PSID as mentioned are you know, some of the common data sets. And we choose SIP, well, first is because SIP provides that unique employer ID, but also you have a high, much larger sample size when compared to either PSID or, or NLSY. And at the same time, the SIP has a monthly frequency. So that's really great. So if we wanna look at um, the monthly changes, those dynamics, for example, recall happens very quickly. And so once you do quarterly, you already miss a lot of recalls and then annually you misses a lot of the information. So I think SIP is really powerful and uh, it's really worth investing the time to, to understand the data and, and, and find questions uh, that you can answer. I'll just underscore everything that Justin said. Those were my motivations for using the SIP. Um, I, it was the perfect data set to be able to look at um, employment transitions and be able to create, um, look at subgroup analysis, even though um, sample size can be um, a little bit tricky with um, other data sets. The SIP has so many um, respondents that you're able to really look at differences across different groups and over time. Thank you. Uh, uh, Shalise, I think you have a question. Yes, uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers and discussants. I have a question for Shanique. I wanted, and I'm sorry, if Shanique, if I'm not, I, I've heard many people pronounce your name and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly myself. Uh, but uh, your paper was very interesting. Everyone's papers was uh, very interesting, but I have a specific question for you. I know that you were looking at uh, stock holding of households, and I'm wondering if you look at the fact of the wrongful uh, this, um, dischargement um, of uh, employees and how that affects liquid assets holding of households in general. I'm just thinking along the lines of falsification, but not even falsification because I don't know if it would be a falsification, a rejection of falsification if you do find an effect for other um, liquid assets holding, such as bonds or checking accounts, um, mutual market uh, accounts, anything like that. I know SEP asks those questions, so I'm wondering if that's something that you could look into. Um, thank you, uh, Charlize, <laughs> if I pronounce your name correctly. Uh, thank you for the question. So the way I measure stock market exposure is the fraction of a risky asset in the total financial wealth. So that total financial wealth includes already a liquid, liquid asset, which are yeah, bonds, checking account, and saving account. So basically what I found is that the importance of that risk asset, which are mutual funds and stock value, goes up relative to those uh, bonds, savings, and checking account value. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any other questions for our presenters? So I have a few minutes if. I actually if have a question for Shanik as well, uh, if you don't mind. So, um, I, so maybe I, I, I missed that part. Uh, maybe you have mentioned that, but I see that you, for the states that have the good faith law, then the, they have more risk taking. Uh, uh, but do you take a look at whether the returns, whether they pick the right stock after um, they, they they take on more risk, whether the benefit, whether it's really beneficial, or do they just uh, go ahead and and be more risk taking and and go reckless? 
Thank you for the question. Uh, ideally, we want to observe the same household, maybe over the long run, maybe five years or six years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with the SIP data, we cannot see the same household uh, and their portfolio changed over a very long run. Um, therefore, I rely on brokerage data from 1991 to 1996, where I can see which securities they actually bought. So yeah, from in my paper, I show that on average, um, their returns are positive. Of course, some household lost uh, money probably <laughs> by investing in some stocks that didn't perform well. On average, they make money. <laughs> yeah. I see. I see. Thanks. Thank you. Any last question, Jason? Go ahead. Yeah. So I know we're we're kind of running a little bit short on time now for me to ask the the question that I really want to ask, but I'll throw it out there for the uh, paper authors to think about um, as we move to, through the day and towards the listening session. Um, you all attached went uh went into sip in lots of different uh lots of different ways um you touched lots of different parts of the data um you use multiple panels um i want the question i want you to it would love to hear from each of you about um is what what was hard what were your challenges what would you want to change you know so these are things that you know it's great to hear positive stuff about sip um, and we really love that, but we also want your input. Um, and if you could take a few minutes during the course of the day and write some of those things down and share them with us during the listening session, we would really appreciate that. Um, so this is, this conference is for you. It's also for us so that we can help make SIP a better program. Back to you. Well Brian. said, thank you, Jason. All right, I think we're we're at the end. Uh, once again, want to thank all of you uh, for taking the time to present, for our discussants for taking the time to read the papers and offer some insightful comments. I appreciate everyone uh, sticking to time, as I mentioned. Um, and I would just ask that you guys attend the other sessions uh, today and tomorrow and enjoy the conference.